I had no choice but to be here today because of too many members of Congress have been gutless on this issue. The time is now. You must act. Be bold, be courageous. Americans are counting on you. Thank you. Echoes of Jim Brady from Gabby Giffords more than 20 years later in that hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee this week. We're back with our roundtable right now. And Matthew Dowd, I want to come to you, but as I come to you, I also want to put up uh, the new uh, salvo in the debate yesterday from President Obama. You saw that picture they released of the president's skeet shooting at Camp David back in August after he said it was something he does all the time up in Camp David. And David Pluff, his former senior advisor, said, puts out a tweet saying, attention skeet birthers, make our day. Let the Photoshop conspiracies begin. Of course, they were answering the skepticism about whether President Obama was really a shooter. But was it smart to put out that photo? Well, I think they had to put out the photo. I think if you go back a few days, I don't think it was very smart for him to make that statement in the New Republic when he said, I shoot skeet all the time up there. Because first of all, it wasn't going to change anybody's mind that's against him. It wasn't going to make anybody think, oh, wow, Barack Obama's this. It reminds me of what my <laughs> paraphrase Margaret Thatcher, which is being a skeet shooter, being a hunter is a lot like being a lady. If you have to tell people are, you're probably not. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe him because of that picture. And that picture, I think, just makes him look like he's pandering. And as Carly said on the break, it he is pandering in that. And I think that's the problem with it, that it's sort of a distraction from the debate. I don't think they should have ever said it. Nobody believes that about And you president. heard Carly Fiorina from Harry Reid right there, that the president is going to have a fairly tough time with his own Democrats yeah. in getting what he wants through the Senate. Yeah. Well, I think that's clearly true. This is a very emotional issue. I honestly think both sides have overplayed it. I think, personally, I think the NRA has overplayed it. We're gun owners at home. Um, but By coming out against background checks? Yes. I mean, I think there's widespread support for universal background checks. However, universal background checks won't work unless we deal with our mental health system and actually untie the Gordian knot of privacy rules so that the right information can be given to people. But universal background checks, let's deal with the mental health system. Personally, I would even support banning high capacity magazines. I think banning assault weapons we proved doesn't work. So instead of just doing something for show, let's actually focus on solving the problem. What, what really strikes me, I don't know how this plays, you know, what will happen. Uh, what strikes me is we've actually gotten a glimpse into the mindset, though, of the, of the pro-gun people. And we've seen certainly Wayne LaPierre and some of these others. Um, it's bizarre. They have this vision that we're living in Mad Max, in a Mad Max movie, and that nothing can be done about it. That that America cannot manage unless everybody's prepared to shoot intruders. That the idea that, that we we have uh, police forces that provide public safety is is somehow totally impractical, despite the fact that you know that is in fact the way we live. So I think that the the terms of the debate have shifted. Now the craziness of the of the extreme pro gun lobby has been revealed, and that has got to move the debate and has got to move the legislation to at least some degree. Are you comfortable where the NRA has been on this? Yeah, I, I am. I mean, this is a, a perfect example why people believe Washington is broke. This horrific uh, incident in Newtown, and here, what is our debate? It, it's focusing on guns. When not, there's not one person at this table who really believes that that's the root of what happened there. And, and uh, when we have people that get into the mindset uh, that they want to harm people, as, as a former mayor, I know People will get guns no matter what laws we pass, just like the illegal drugs. I just drug. say that I, just I caught that you on a false uh, statement there because at least I do believe that guns are the root. There are crazy people right. everywhere, but mass murders are a lot more common if, here if than If you believe guns are gun more control. important than, than dealing with mental health and our culture, is our culture uh, lending itself that we're raising children that are desensitized uh, to, to murder, yes. to, to killing people? I look at the international differences point, and countries that have effective uh, gun control well then, have a lot well, fewer Would incidents. banning spoons stop obesity? Of course not. Banning uh, large soda drinks does, however, there's, help. There's high tolerance for, for violence in this country. I mean, after Col Columbia, uh, Col Columbine, after Virginia Tech, after Aurora, right. we should have done something, and we haven't. Uh, sometimes it seems that it's only uh, minor changes that we're talking about, even uh, ban on assault weapons or background right. checks, or talking about high capacity magazines. I mean, we know what works. I mean, in Japan, it works. But as a country, I don't think we are willing 
to even revisit the Second Amendment. But, but, and, and Paul, Paul, said, Paul said something yeah, that, works. that we know exactly that what is works. illustrative. We don't want to do it. But uh, we, Paul, we have to recognize that. Paul said something that's illustrative of what I meant when I said people overplay their hands. What Paul just did was lump everybody together as a crazy radical gun owner. Not so it, yes. So you're condemning. People. No, there are plenty of gun owners who are fine, but but the lobbying groups, the NRA, is now revealed as an insane organization, and that matters quite a lot. I said at the outset, I think the NRA overplayed its hand a bit. More than that. I think More than we just should support its hand. universal background checks. On the other hand, we need to say that if let's just say Diane Feinstein's bill passed banning assault weapons, it won't do anything to solve but, the problem. But, there, let's no, solve but after the, the last problem. assault weapons ban, and I'll bring this to Matthew mm -hmm. Dow, there was some evidence by independent uh, uh, experts who looked at it and said, listen, it didn't solve the problem completely, but during, when the ban was in place, fewer people were killed by assault weapons, and when it was lifted, more people were killed by assault weapons. But, George, but people also that, said more people bought, bought assault weapons right before that ban went into place, and as soon as it was lifted, they bought well, more, and we now have 300 million of them I in the think country. part of the problem is, and I think the congressman said this, but part of the problem is, is all the facts on both sides get left on the table and we get into this thing where no, everybody says this is what we need to do and many of the facts get left on the table. Right. We all know that if you only do something on assault weapons, it's not going to solve the problem that happened. If you only do something on high capacity, it's not going to solve the problem. If you only do something on this and the other facts that get left and the idea that a gun in the home or people have a gun is going to make somebody safer, all the facts say that's just not true. It, the likelihood of somebody that's in a domestic violence case where there's a gun available is eight times more likely, a woman is eight times more likely to get killed. The, li the likelihood likelihood that if a woman has, if there's a gun in a home, there's three times more likely that she's going to get murdered. Everybody leaves the facts. I don't think it would be a bad thing. Most people on that own guns, and I'm a gun owner like Carly is, thinks many of the things that are going on is people are unwilling to say, let's get rid of the Second Amendment. Maybe we you should have a debate that. about that. Let's, uh, that is a huge debate. I want to move on to the economy because we have a lot to cover uh, today. And Paul Krug, I want to come to you with this. We saw the Dow hit 14,000 right. on Friday, capping a, a just a torrid. January, four, five straight weeks of gains. This comes on top of some encouraging news on jobs, right. some encouraging news on housing and manufacturing. And I was struck by a, a line in the Washington Post that said, uh, the biggest threat now to the recovery may be Washington, D.C. Well, that's been true all along. I mean, what we've actually been seeing is, um, Let's put it this way. We've, we've seen falling government spending, particularly spending purchases of goods and services, or actually government buying stuff, an unprecedented decline in that. And that's the biggest threat to the recovery. And caused if, GDP slippage in the fourth that's quarter. That's right. The GDP slippage in the fourth quarter was partly just statistical illusion, but partly defense spending, which for some reason had a, had a big negative blip. But no, if I, I've actually been doing some numbers on this. If spending had grown in this business cycle the way it did in the last one under Bush, or under Reagan, we would probably have an unemployment rate that was not much above 6% right now. So this is this, this Washington craziness, these, and of course the threat of the sequester that is the biggest threat. This recovery is actually, you know, it should be much, much faster. We still have more than 3 million people who've been out of work for more than a year. That's, that's terrible. But we are in fact gaining momentum. Housing is recovering. The labor market is slowly recovering. Yeah, Washington may, may mess it up. You agree? I think it's important to remember when we talk about the economy that a private sector job and a public sector job are not the same things. They're not equivalent. I'm not saying public sector jobs aren't important, but a private sector job pays for itself. A private sector job creates other jobs. A public sector job is paid for by tax hold payers. The government does not spend and invest money as efficiently as the private sector. There's all kinds of data to support that. So it isn't simply a matter of saying, well, whatever job is created out there, if it's a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., or a small business owner hiring another employee, those are not equivalent things. But when we say things. public sector jobs, it is not a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. Well, when we talk is, about public actually. sector jobs, we look at the public sector jobs that have been lost in large numbers in this. It's basically school teachers. Don't think about bureaucrats. It's school teachers. What we've laid off is hundreds of thousands of school teachers. And we talk about the cuts in public spending that have happened. They are not, you know, some god awful who knows what. It's actually public investment. It's largely fixing potholes and repairing bridges. So, you know, you have this image of these wasteful bureaucrats doing god knows what. What we've actually seen is an incredible drought of basic infrastructure it, it and, and, and laying off hundreds it, of thousands it, of school teachers. It is a fact that virtually every department in every organization in Washington, D.C., has seen its budget increase for the last 40 years. 
that money is being paid to hire people. The number of people who yes. are, of course almost, there are some teachers. Almost no. Of course there the are some police officers. Of, I'm not saying that. The vast bulk of public sector employees are at the state and local level. They are largely school teachers plus police officers plus firefighters. So you and your notion that it's all these bureaucrats, that's a myth that is used to... It's but not what is clearly going to happen it's on March 1st now is sequester. We don't have enough private sector job creation. We, we, we heard from Harry Reid that he, he's hoping the sequester doesn't kick in, but Congressman, I've noticed from top Republican leaders seem to be uh, accepting the fact that we're going to have these across-the-board budget cuts on March 1st. Talking to White House officials, you get the sense that they're prepared to go through with it as well. That could be a big hit on the economy. I, I do believe that my sense is the sequester is going to go through. Uh, it was put in place to, so we didn't get to this point, but it is. It's a law, and I, I believe uh, we understand it's not what we want. On our side, I know the defense cuts are, are very hard for many of us to, uh, to swallow, but at the end of the day, uh, Washington needs to do something about its spending. We are spiraling out of control. This country can't survive. We can't sustain uh, the spending that's going on. Matthew, what's your sense of what the public reaction is going to be? Because it does appear that the sequester is going to hit for at least a period of time. These across-the-board budget cuts, maybe even a government shutdown at the end of March. Well, I think the fundamental problem I think that exists today is long before all this is be the public looks at Washington as completely out of sync of where they are in their life. They think Washington is totally dysfunctional. They don't trust anything that comes out of Washington. Wherever they, whether they're progressive or whether they're conservative, they do not trust Washington. And until that trust is rebuilt, part of it has to do with the fiscal mess. Part of it has to do with the lack of leadership. But as they watch Washington day in and day out, you look at the numbers of trust in Washington. FDR understood this. If you go back and look at FDR and you look at John F. Kennedy and all the folks, John F. Kennedy, all the folks that basically said we want government to be more involved, they understood that the people have to trust government before you get government more involved. And that's and, a huge and, and part and of the problem. If it happens, it might lead to, um, to another recession. I don't know. You yeah. know much more about uh, that. Uh, but there no, is an that's important thing to say here, though, that the sequester is not nearly as scary as the debt ceiling debate was. Clearly. If we, if we fail to make payments on debt, even for a day, nobody knew what would happen. We thought the whole world financial system might collapse. If we go a month into the sequester, it's not a big deal. It's going to be painful. It's going to be a big debate. It'll slow growth in that quarter. But this is something where, actually, I, my understanding is the White House thinks that, that this will, they will win this, that if it happens, that it, you know, everybody will look bad, but the Republicans will look worse, and in the end, they will fold. I'm hearing the same things, Carly. They believe it in the end. You'll see the same thing happen that happened on the debt limit, that the Republicans are going to have to accept some new revenues, even though they say they're not going to do it now. Well, you know, First of all, I think this White House spends way too much time thinking about political wins and not enough time thinking about actually solving the problem. Tax reform is a way to get more revenues. If we would close loopholes, lower rates, simplify the tax code, there is broad bipartisan support for that. It would increase revenues. It would help small business but you're, owners. You're, you're for tax reform that increases revenues. A lot of Republican leaders are saying they would only do revenue neutral tax reform. Well, in my particular opinion, what we need to be competitive, what we need to help small business owners is to lower all the rates, close all the loopholes, which frankly benefit big business, not small business, vastly simplify the code. But going back to Matthew's point, there was an interesting poll in the Washington Post, 53 percent of the American people believe the federal government is a threat in their lives. That's an incredible figure. And what it says is that people truly believe that they can't trust the federal government. And George, it's part something of the, people the have to deal with. Part of the with. problem is, is that it, leaders are now left with this pile. So what you basically have is Republicans say, don't touch defense. We don't want to cut defense. Not all of them, but so many of them say don't touch, touch defense. Democrats say, do not touch entitlement programs. Do not touch entitlement programs. In a year, that will be 80, those two things will be 85%, include, add interest on the debt, will 85% of the bud, total budget, which leaves only 15% of looking forward, what are we going to do, how do we want to create an economy, what's going to happen, and neither side is willing to have that debate. Both sides, in my view, are willing to basically deficit spend and run us into a fiscal problem. Republicans are unwilling to touch revenue, so they say let's deficit spend in order to keep taxes low. Democrats are un unwilling to address government spending, so they deficit spend both sides, which is why the country does not trust Washington. I want to get quick to another issue. Chuck Hagel's confirmation hearing this week, not even the White House would defend his performance. Here was a piece of it. I support the president's uh, strong position on containment, uh, as I said. I if I said that, it, it meant to say that I obviously his position on containment, we don't have a position on containment. We do have a position on containment, which is that we do not favor containment. 
I think it was kind of a surprise there uh, from Chuck Hagel. Yeah. Probably not going to hurt his chances of confirmation. He's even getting some Republican the support. The votes are definitely. He's, I think he's going to make it. But if you have to clarify your clarification, you're you're in trouble. No. Uh, obviously, I mean, if we compare, for instance, what he went through with what Hillary Clinton did with the Benghazi hearings, he's a completely two different perspectives. Now, Hillary Clinton was strong and solid and getting ready for 2016. At the same time, Chuck Hagel, he seemed timid, tentative, and. Uh, you're in the uh, House. You don't want. No, you don't want that. You're in the House, not the Senate. But some Republican senators considering whether to filibuster or not. You think that would be wise? Um, I'm not certain if it'll be wise or not. I know there's some concerns about his positions with Israel and and whether or not that will carry uh, uh, water at the end of the day. But um, you know, again, it it will be a, a decision that the Senate's going to make, and and really not in the House. George, I, I mean, I think obviously he could have done better, but to me, there's a couple of things about that. First, it'd be unfortunate that the first time we'd have an enlisted person, enlisted somebody that was an enlisted man, just an average military guy, to run the Department of Defense that's going to make decisions on war. The first time that's going to ever happen in our history, I think, is an important thing for many soldiers out there who feel disconnected from the process because it, somebody's never really understood that. The other thing is, you watch that hearing, and I watch most of the hearing, which you come away with is nobody is willing to ask questions in any of these to actually elicit information that might be helpful. All people are doing theater. is, it's all theater and it's all this, how do I put points on the board? John McCain or the Senator Graham, it's how do I put a point against him? The Democrats get up there and make a long speech and say, how do I put a point for him? And no, but these hearings used to be, long time ago, used to be like, let's find out how he would manage the Defense Department. Let's find out what, did, what his values are that we might be important to us to know. None of that happens. It's all just about making points. I think what's clear is that President Obama miscalculated a bit, thinking if I put forward someone with an R next to their name, I'm going to have an easier time here. Clearly, that's not the case. But I also think that, you know, John McCain certainly did his bit for his country and languished in a prisoner of war camp for five and a half years. I think John McCain and Lindsey Graham's concerns are real. In the end, they probably will not carry the day. But in a critical time with the threats we face, it's totally legitimate, whoever the nominee was, to get grilled on what their point of view is. I want to get to one final issue before we go. Big night tonight, the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. The ads have already been sold. 3.8 to 4 million million dollars for a 30-second ad, but this year is something a little bit different. We've seen so many of the ads before the game, getting a lot of commentary. My favorite is going to nominate it first, uh, that Volkswagen Come On Be Happy ad. Sticky bun come soon. Yeah! Wicked coffee, Mr. Jim! Julia, turn the frown the other way around. Hey, Dave, you're from Minnesota, right? Yes, I. The land of 10,000 lakes. Jorge, your pick. <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, GoDaddy.com. That case between the model and the nerd went on and on and on. I think it was really raw, and I think it's going to be very controversial. Bar, well, yeah, we're going to see it right here. There's Bar Raffaelli uh, right there, and she's going to lip lock with that young man, that lucky young man right there. Yeah, and then you cut it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you don't want to see it. All right, well, I, the Mercedes ad with, uh, with, with uh, the, the devil, uh, William Defoe uh, as the devil, caught my attention mostly because of the background music, because I remember when the Rolling Stones sang about, uh, you know, uh, uh, nice making stuff. fun of ads which say you can't be a man if you don't smoke the cigarettes as me. And now we've got sympathy for the devil in a Mercedes ad. And what the age of Aquarius to? is really over. <laughs> and mine is one that we haven't seen yet, which I'm hoping to see, which is last year, which was Chrysler ad. They're, they're, they bought an ad in this. I thought last year's Chrysler ad was one of the best ads done. It was the Clint Eastwood narrated Halftime in America ad. They've done some great ads, the whole idea of imported from Detroit. So Paul and I have a difference. He's at the imported car. I have the Chrysler car, but I'm looking forward to the Chrysler ad. I like the Allstate, Allstate Ma'am ad, and it's probably based on some of their ads before that it, it it just strikes me. It goes as all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I like that one too. Yeah. That's a pretty great ad. It really yeah. was. Thank you all Thank you. for your contributions Thank you. today. Jorge Ramos is going to stick around to answer your Facebook questions for our web extra.